at Brain and Spine Group and the Women in Neurosurgery Medical Student Committee. Um, just to go over a quick rundown of how the day is going to go, um, our first hour here is with Dr. Deborah Benzel giving her keynote um, on finding happiness as a trailblazer that will begin shortly. And after that, we're going to move over to our Zoom platform for the rest of the day. Um, our first panel is the value of female mentorship. And we're gonna have a brief lunch break after that, followed by another panel on um, academic and organized neurosurgery, uh, a talk from Dr. Eve Sai on research as a woman neurosurgeon scientist, a brief talk from Dr. Sharona Benheim on the WINS organization as a whole, and then we'll have another brief networking break and round out the day with a panel on real life as a woman neurosurgeon. So please make sure to hop over to the Zoom after this talk um, for the rest of the day. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce very quickly Dr. Benzel. Uh, Dr. Benzel, Deborah Benzel, uh, was raised in rural Maryland along with two sisters. She received her undergraduate degree from Brown University in 1981. Following that, she was awarded her medical degree from the University of Maryland in 1985. Um, from 1985 to 87, Dr. Benzel completed a two-year fellowship in surgical neurology at the National Institutes of Health, doing molecular biology research on malignant brain tumors. She then returned to Providence to complete her neurosurgical residency through Brown University, Rhode Island Hospital from 1988 to 1994. During her residency, she was granted the prestigious Anthony Greedo Fellowship from the Association of Brain Tumor Research to continue her molecular biology research on brain tumors. In 1994, Dr. Benzel was hired as faculty at New York Medical College as an assistant professor. She rose to the rank of associate professor and became co-director of the programs in neuro-oncology, peripheral nerve, and stereotactic radiosurgery. In 2001, she led the team that introduced one of the first comprehensive spine stereotactic radiosurgery programs in the world. Since 2018, Dr. Benzel has served as vice chair, Department of Neurosurgery, uh, of the Cleveland Clinic, where she provides comprehensive state-of-the-art patient-centered care to patients with a wide spectrum of neurosurgical diseases. In 2019, Dr. Benzel achieved the rank of full professor of neurosurgery at Cleveland Clinic Learner School of Medicine uh, within Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Prior to this, she served as faculty in the Department of Neurosurgery, Columbia University Medical Center, where she developed and introduced the first comprehensive socioeconomic course for neurosurgical residents. Uh, Dr. Benzel is nationally known for her work in spine stereotactic radiosurgery, innovation in resident education, and socioeconomic expertise. Her publications are focused on tumors, stereotactic radiosurgery, resident education, and socioeconomic issues. She is active in organized neurosurgery, where she has served as the AANS as a director at large on the board and then vice president of the AANS and editor of the AANS Neurosurgeon. Uh, for the Society of Neurological Surgeons, she has been on the Executive Council, Vice President and Director of the Senior Boot Camp, as well as leading the task force assessing the long-term impact of the pandemic on academic neurosurgery. From 2018 to 2020, she served on the Scientific Planning Committee of the SNS and as Chair for the 2020 Annual Meeting in Philadelphia. Within the SNS, she has also been active in the core committee. Other notable leadership positions include chair of the CSNS and chair of the Communication and Public Relations Committee of the Washington Committee. She was a founding member and first president of the Women in Neurosurgery Organization and remains as emeritus on the WINS Executive Board. Her long-term contributions to WINS have been honored with an eponymous mentorship award. Dr. Benzel and her husband, a molecular biologist, have a son and a daughter and three grandchildren. Outside of neurosurgery, she loves travel, theater, literature, hiking, and wine. Uh, and with that, I will let Dr. Benzel take over here. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Benzel. My pleasure. Uh, so will you toggle to my slides or shall I do that now? Uh, so Dr. Benzel, you'll have, just have to share your slides now and then we'll be okay. able to toggle them onto the screen. Terrific. Um, technical issues, hopefully notwithstanding, will uh, get started. Who would have imagined a girl from rural Maryland, a town with more farmers, a keynote speaker as a neurosurgeon? That wasn't the path my life was likely to follow. There was much about that girl that did not fit. I was active and played sports, not a cheerleader or a wallflower. 
I was tall, large boned, had unruly dark hair and Mediterranean feature where all the gentlemen in my community preferred petite I attended and just 16% on to further education, and yet I aspired to attend a competitive college. Many of my classmates dropped out at age 16, died from overdoses or drunk driving, or got married. I was a female who was intellectually curious, avidly read books, and yearned to explore the wide world. That added up to a tough childhood. But those struggles imbued me with an internal strength and drive, essential as I quickly discovered that to succeed, it, to succeed, I needed perseverance to find alternative pathways, to anticipate challenges, to establish a support network, to take control emotional and physical well-being. Surviving those battles brought me to this forum, delivering this keynote address with an audience that includes an amazing diversity. While I've only met a few of you, I know that you will be instrumental in shaping the future of medicine and neurosurgery in incredibly exciting ways. My career journey led me to be the position as vice chair of neurosurgery at the Cleveland Clinic, where I joined, <laughs> Um, uh, a mentor and colleague, the other Dr. Benzel, after many years of remote collaboration. That was a real joy. Across my long career, I have had the fortune to know many individuals who have scaled Herculean heights and impacted me enormously. Many neurosurgeons, but also other physicians, professionals, and community leaders. I have much for which to be grateful. Notably, these individuals have pioneered in the departments at the leadership table or by speaking out against harassment, healthcare disparity, or other injustices. One of my close colleagues established a leadership initiative so successful, it is now a model of best practices. While those of you attending today are relatively early in your careers, I want to start by honoring each of you. For all that you have already accomplished and the people whose lives you have touched, please stand. I can't see you, but I want everybody at home to stand up. Now let's have a loud and an enthusiastic round of applause and send up all those emojis. After today's program, call your parents, tell them that you got a standing ovation for being so very special. We are all so very special. I am not alone. You are not alone. Together, we are not alone. When I was first approached to give this talk, I was suffused with joy. What an honor and opportunity. There were so many things that I wanted to say and stories I wanted to share. How could I possibly choose? Hands up if you want the two hour version of this talk, or you can just ask me questions later. I wished it to be powerful, meaningful, and transformative, but I also wanted to speak from my own heart and my own experience. Turning to friends and colleagues, I asked them, what do you think I can best offer to a group of aspiring physicians? This was about our future and ultimately the future of others whose lives we touch. Thus was born the seed of today's flower, finding happiness as a trailblazer. Finding because it is a journey, an active process. Happiness because the joy is what allows the greatest impact. And trailblazing because each of us are setting new paths breaking barriers and shattering glass houses. It is a quality inside of us, not something retrospectively defined by accomplishments. Each of us can blaze new opportunities for growth and change. First, allow me to set my stage. So who am I? Well, this is Frida Kranzer Scharf, my grandmother. She was the architect of my family's escape from Nazi Germany their entry first into Palestine and eventually the US against all odds and immigration quotas and ultimately responsible for their long-term stability and success. She was a woman of remarkable intelligence, bravery and insight. With little formal education, she spoke at least six languages, read extensively and had the organizational and financial skills that equaled many in business. She passed her courage, determination, and fierce individuality to me. Given her many of life's challenges, she had few um, precious possessions, but before she died, 
more than two decades ago, of a malignant brain tumor, by the way. She gifted me a special ring. I wear this ring on all occasions when I most want to feel her strength and fortitude, like today. This is my husband and best friend, Dr. Paul Finch. He makes me laugh, holds me when I cry, is my fiercest supporter, and my most honest critic. When we met, I was doing research at NIH by day and bartending at night. And many of his friends believe our love flourished because of the free drinks I surreptitiously passed his way. Seriously, Paul has stood by me and with me for more than 35 years and has helped me to be a better person. Throughout my long and often treacherous journey into and through neurosurgery, Paul was there. This is me, a girl from rural Maryland who refused to accept no. I am wife, mother, grandmother, consultant, neurosurgeon, and a proud and happy trailblazer. Just recently, I have come to understand that I really have helped affect meaningful and important change in medicine and neurosurgery. Some of that work will amplify over time as part of me is carried forward in others, like all of you. After the years of struggles, the very dark nights, and the lonesome days, I am satisfied and content. We all deserve no less. The future of medicine relies on us being drivers of a necessary evolution, because in the end, it's our patients who need us. All of us and our loved ones are those patients who deserve the best. Now that my career journey nears its final stages, I finally understand the framework that supported me and enabled my success, but only by looking back and after considerable thought. Tonight, today, I share that knowledge so that you can deploy it proactively and achieve your own happiness as a trailblazer. My mnemonic is the Benzel Bees. Build your box, be marvelous, and believe. Let me demonstrate the essence of these concepts and why each is important. Safety and security start with building your own box as your essential core. You must understand who you are before you can securely navigate beyond to break out of the box. The imagery of the box is powerful. Your box safeguards what is key to who you are and what matters. It is a metaphysical place of refuge and protection. It can also help you to set boundaries so you focus on what's most important. Your box can also conceal anything you don't need others to see or to know. Our boxes are unique and special. They do not remain static over time, nor do they limit us. Perhaps it's not obvious how building your box helps you to gain strength and resilience. Let me share some real life illustrations. One of my students recently asked, how can I be myself and yet fit into a world that is so different to mine? Together we explored which elements of herself she felt she had to conceal inside her box. What things were so important to protect for herself and others inside her box? And how did she think her box differed or intersected with her perception of other people's boxes. Through these explorations, she gained confidence that she did in fact belong, that she wasn't viewed as an alien, but also that it wasn't always critical to reveal all about herself at work. Finding and fostering a common purpose was critical. And through this, she found the guardrails to accomplish much in her career without sacrificing her own self-esteem. Perhaps other examples can show the importance of building your own box. Most of us are challenged by having too many demands on our time, our focus, and our finances. Your own artisanal box should enable your special choice of boundaries to keep you on your incredible journey. Another important exemplar, while mo much attention recently has focused on other aspects of diversity, gender bias is still the most common experience across medicine. We recently published a depressing study that showed that 66% of neurosurgeons reported experiencing sexual harassment. This behavior is always unacceptable. For too many years, I did not have the strength of my own box to speak out when I witnessed bullying, harassment, bias, and microaggressions. Over time, I have learned that not speaking out was worse than silence, that my failure to protect this fundamental concept hurt me in so many ways because I also had to shoulder the extra burden of guilt and self-denial while others were harmed. What changed this for me? I learned a remarkably simple concept, 
address the behavior and not the person or background. Others are, to a reasonable degree, free to think what they want. They just can't allow that to result in unacceptable behavior. I have dedicated considerable effort to teaching this approach to others, helping them to disengage from the rhetoric and understanding that through comprehending what behaviors are acceptable and how to optimally respond when behaviors stray, we can and will create safe and supportive working environments. And guess what? When you change behavior, it invariably leads to changing hearts and minds. Thus, loyalty to your own box can lead others to modify their boxes in a positive way. In a completely different vein, I doggedly refused to listen to Billy Joel or the Carpenters during surgery, and I'm not afraid to let everyone know. As to much of the music others want to hear, I am willing to step outside of my box for the sake of the team. Some things just aren't that important. Perhaps for you, what is inside or outside your box is very different. Maybe you have a tattoo you feel that others might ridicule, political beliefs that don't match your colleagues, something in your past that doesn't fit with who you are now. For all these things decide, what is essential to your core that it must always be expressed or protected? What are the parts of you that others don't need to see because it really doesn't impact your work or relationship. Your box also helps you to understand how, how your goals and needs may actually align with others who might have boxes of really different shapes, size, or colors. No one can answer these questions but you. They're not answers easily found, and they require time to think about who you are, what is your center, where are your boundaries, how do you build your own box and establish your own core? I had to leave my small hometown, shrug off the shackles of many traditions and take the leap to new ideas, places and people to find my own box as my core to allow me to then soar beyond it. Today, commit to building your box, to embarking on a life and a career in which you are true to, what, to that which is most important, even if it isn't all of who you are and especially when your box doesn't completely match the boxes of others around you. Your box will guide you, protect you, and set you free. When you allow your box to fail, confidence erodes and progress slows. Building your box is a crucial step in finding happiness as a trailblazer. For years, whenever we asked our son what the moral of a story was, he would think for some time and then always gave us the same answer. Be good. Wasn't a bad answer when he was five, but as he got older, we expected something a little bit more nuanced. Being good is a remarkably simple concept that I have rechristened Be Marvelous. This is not about your external persona. I mean, not many of us will ever look like Rihanna six months pregnant, but that's okay. This is about what is inside of you. To find happiness as a trailblazer, you cannot overlook self-care. Career satisfaction, as well as our relationships, depend on us remaining centered and strong. We have all thought the same thing. I don't have time for myself. I can't possibly add anything to my day or life. To that I admonish, you can't afford not to. I have experienced the physical and emotional ravages of neglecting myself and the subsequent impact on my patients, family, and my own health. It threatened me and was a constant source of conflict. During these times, I struggled to find any joy in life. Well, perhaps only in too many chocolates and donuts. Thus, I have become a very practical well-being advocate. I trust basic things that have worked for me and my friends. Here are some examples. Pack your lunch. It saves money, too. Buy a sparkling water device for your office, and it honors our planet's limited resources. Place a standing order for flower delivery. Set an immutable leaving time and stick with it. Have dinner with your family on a regular basis. Calendar workouts or other important activities. Perhaps best of all, share tips and tricks with your friends and colleagues. Today, commit to starting just one thing for yourself. Once you establish one in your routine, then you can consider adding on another and then another. The trick is bringing the downward spiral to a stop. As the old physics law states, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. Give your well-being the inertia it needs, heading in a positive direction. How important is it to be marvelous inside? 
vary. The suicide rate for physicians is more than double that of the general population. Women physicians succumb at twice the rate of our male colleagues. On average, one physician dies from suicide every day. Our work is stressful, our lives are complex. And studies show that women still do 80% of the work for our home and family, even when we work full time and are the primary wage earners. The gender tax for us amounts to two hours a day. Wow, just think of all that extra sleep, time to exercise or read. Despite this, women still earn less than 80 cents on the dollar, which amounts to at least $2 million over a typical physician's career. Women are particularly bad at looking after our own health and well-being, classically placing everyone else's needs before our own. One cannot overstate the importance of resilience as an essential component of being marvelous. Tough days are always going to happen. Bad things will be strewn in our pathway, especially as physicians. And neurosurgery is a journey filled with boulders, potholes, and minefields. The capacity to recover will prove critical. Please hear me. It is impossible to run the women's career marathon without self-care. I am not a superwoman, and accepting that was key to my own happiness and success. Only with this do we gain the strength and endurance and resilience to help ourselves and others to sustain the fight. Being marvelous requires us to put me first some of the time and not feel guilt for doing so. Trailblazing is slow and painful. For long stretches, it can feel like there is little change or progress. Meaningful transformation happens slowly, painfully slowly. It feels stagnant and frustrating, the bruises accumulating without any victories. Through tough times, you must believe in yourself, the power of innovation, and the benefits of change. Too many contemporaries, me included, declared, I give up. This isn't working. Things remain the same. What can I share to help each of you so you will continue to believe and sustain your efforts over time? Perhaps understanding the stages of social change will help sustain your belief. Perspective is a marvelous gift which eluded me for a long time and thus has challenged my own belief. First is the stage of individuals, those who try something different or step out to support them. Next comes the supporting period with interventions targeting those groups who have been left out or left behind. And finally, the systems phase, with the recognition of the role of systems in sustaining the undesired status and thus blocking change. So ISS, individuals, supporting, and systems. Diversity in medicine epitomizes this phenomenon. When I was struggling to break through the barriers of entering the world of neurosurgery, there was a chief of medicine who stood by my side and supported my dream. He worked to build my confidence, prepare me for interviews. He asked probing questions when I met with failure and helped me to decide whether to continue the fight. And when my finances, or lack of them, became an enormous stumbling block, he even found a way to give me lucrative hours moonlighting to bridge me over and stay out of the creditor's grasp. To this day, I do not know what motivated his dedication to my crazy dreams. But I do know that his singular efforts of this one individual made the difference to me in my quest. There are also those individuals who have accepted the first women in their residency programs or faculty who advocated for women or who spoke out against injustice, bias, and harassment. There are also individuals who take the risk of, of attempting something audacious. Notable examples include Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, who is the first female MD, American female MD. Dr. Mary Edward Walker, who is the first American female surgeon. And of course, Dr. Corinne Morasco, who is the first female chair of an academic neurosurgery department. All of you are included because you blaze your own path forward against all odds, often making sacrifices that are unimaginable. Fortunately, within medicine, and even within neurosurgery, this phase has largely passed. Once the doors open a crack, the supporting phase begins. This is when those who are left behind or oppressed are told why they're not qualified for advancement, how their skills lack, 
or their commitment is lacking or just why we're not succeeding. We are offered tutelage in being skilled communicators and better leaders in wearing the right clothes, saying the correct words of never offending and always letting other get the credit for our hard work and great ideas. Those providing the support can feel altruistic. Look at what I'm doing to help. At first, being chosen for these interventions feels special, but slowly one realized that often the unvoiced agenda is to make us fit better into their world, to maintain the status quo, and sometimes to cling to outdated concepts. Slowly, one can start to feel a little victimized or belittled. For many, this is the most difficult phase to navigate. Most likely, you are still quite isolated. Did you know that only 9% of medical professors are females, while more than 52% of medical students are? You are enticed by the opportunities they dangle before you, while you worry about your future career and perhaps even your ability to continue. It is common during this stage for individuals within a minority to wonder if they really need or want to be identified by that moniker, if they need to associate with or seek out others with similar backgrounds. No longer the first or the only, perhaps they feel safest melting into the group. Unfortunately, insufficient transformation has just transpired and ultimately the need to connect within a group is recognized in hindsight, sometimes later than is optimal. The possibility of assimilation is tantalizing, but I strongly encourage each of you to actively seek a parallel bond with those who share your underrepresented status. The time will come when you will be thankful for these connections. Finally comes the stage where there is acknowledgement and realization that much of the problem is not the fault of the oppressed or the minority, but in numerous factors hardwired within the system. In fact, these systems issues are often so compelling they can override the individuals who may no longer hold on to these outdated notions. Second generation bias typifies this problem because achievement and success is defined such that only individuals similar to the traditional majority are likely to meet the criteria. For example, when new leaders are selected, the job description sounds too much like those who have served for generations, that is, white males who have poor work-life balance and still believe in the value of a hierarchical structure and limited interest in change, despite the fact that medicine has radically transformed over the years. Today's physician and healthcare leaders need extensive administrative, financial, and strategic skills and should display innovative and collaborative leadership styles. Yet these characteristics are not valued enough, leading at best to sustaining existing conditions and sometimes worse. I have been extremely fortunate to experience a real exception to this. One of the reasons that I have found such tremendous job satisfaction at my current position at the Cleveland Clinic is that I have worked under the inspired and forward-thinking leadership of both Dr. Andre Machado, who chairs the NI, and Dr. Mike Steinmetz, who chairs the neurosurgery. I so admire and value the impact they have through their innovative and collaborative leadership. Beyond diversity, other types of systems change will experience parallel, slow, and incremental evolution, often with considerable detours and missteps along the way. Having brave, aspirational goals helps propel you forward in creating new paradigms and sustaining your courage. I encourage you all to watch the inspiring message about courage delivered by Maria Shriver to the University of Michigan graduates in 2022. This is widely available across the internet. She talks a lot about encourage, courage, strength, and resilience. My strength and resilience was supported by holding on to my aspirational belief that I could make neurosurgery better by making it more accepting to women and minorities. In addition, I somewhat arrogantly thought that girls and young women might be inspired by seeing, hearing, or encountering a woman neurosurgeon and being inspired to reach for their own remote stars. Those ideas helped support me during the many, many dark moments. As Maria would note decades later, these goals helped me to overcome my fears and to recognize I had within me all it took to be brave and to propel things forward to a better place. Somebody recently asked me to imagine my life as a male neurosurgeon. 
working 10 to 20% less to accomplish the same outcome. I just shook my head. I have never walked one day in those shoes. And so even my fertile imagination cannot conjure up that life. I cannot imagine a career in which I wasn't excluded from most formal and informal networking and career opportunities. I cannot fathom the wardrobe ease and comfort that professional men boast, such as their flat, sensible shoes. A day without reference to chair men, man power, the guys, his, he, and other gender specific language used universally remains a fantasy. Despite this, I can relate real progress in medicine, surgery, and neurosurgery. Today, few surgeons' lounges remain inside the male locker room. Yes, that's where they all were when I started. And scrub dresses are no longer required. Yes, I was required to wear a dress, though today's scrubs still do not fit most women's figures well. And within neurosurgery, we now represent 20% of the entering resident cohort. Most of the world of medicine now supports paid parental leave, something unimaginable when I had my children. In fact, I had to use all my vacation as my maternity leave, just four weeks. These are small but tangible steps. They help sustain my belief in the value of trailblazing. In order to believe and sustain that belief over time, you also need support. Each of us must actively fight against isolation and develop networks where we feel safe, secure, and learn. I was incredibly fortunate to have my Goggin, my good old girls network. Um, we met while we were all residents, all from different programs, and have remained friends and colleagues over decades, though we pursued different specialties, practice environments, geographical locations, and personal lives. All four of us, of us have reached amazing heights in our chosen pursuits within neurosurgery. And I know Gail was your keynote speaker last year. We bounce ideas and share tricks from child rearing to negotiation. We laugh and we cry together. I know I speak for all four of us in saying this networking has been invaluable to our own happiness and success. If you don't have this, you must create it somehow. It does not have to be in your own specialty or even in your own profession. It just needs to provide you with honest but enduring support you need. Trailblazing is important to welcome and reward. A remarkable celebration of this is Apple's clever advertising campaign, Think Different. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs and the square holes, the one who sees things differently. They are not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them, but the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. I think many of us relate to this description. Often we have been labeled crazy, rebellious, or just plain arrogant to dream big and think different. We must continue to nurture that part of us to push ourselves and our profession and the world forward. We need it, our patients need it, and all of humanity deserves it. We can accomplish this because we are all strong. I have learned that for me, strong does not require long blonde hair or male genitalia, traditional marriage or outmoded gender definitions, a well-trodden pathway of specialty or career, blind acceptance of the status quo. Each of us must celebrate our own strong because it is self-defined. Strong is who we are and what we want to be and permitting ourselves happiness and whatever those choices are. It is also willingness to accept others on their own terms. The challenge of our profession is to envision how to deliver exemplary medical care for the future, not just to fine tune and improve how we practice now. This will require that we embrace a trailblazing philosophy, not just tinker with tradition. Everyone here has that capacity, but to be effective and sustain the work is hard. The B should help ease the load, build your box, be marvelous and believe. This will help support you as, as you become an agent of change and reap the resulting rewards. My road has been long with many dark and difficult stretches. Now I feel the sun on my face almost every day. 
You are all part of that joy. Go find your own path. It may look very different from mine. It may not even lead to a title or a position, but it is your own unique journey. I have found my happiness as a trailblazer. It's your turn now. Thank you so much, Dr. Benzel. That was wonderful. Um, for anybody watching, feel free to throw some questions in the chat, but I do have a few questions to start with. Um, what do you think is the greatest challenge facing women neurosurgeons today? So am I frozen again? <laughs> Looks like I'm frozen up and now I'm not. Great. Um, okay. <laughs> so I, I think right now what the challenge is, is that um, the the, the roadblocks and the boundaries that we have are now not quite as blatant and upfront as they used to be. So when I was training, I just got lots of no's. No, you can't. No, you can't be a neurosurgeon. No, we don't want you. No, you can't have kids. And, and people were very upfront about it. It wasn't pleasant and it wasn't easy, but, but people were very direct about it. Now, I think a lot of that is very concealed. And so we still face discrimination. We still, still face harassment. We still have lots of challenges in being able to be, be who we want to be and be accepted, um, but it's all kind of under the radar. And so it's a little bit harder to battle against that when you don't really know, not so much who your enemies are, but who are the people who aren't fully supportive of the work that you do or understand um, how it is. You know, midway through my career, I mean, I, I, I used to get a lot of people saying things like, gee, I don't know how you're a mom and a neurosurgeon. And it's kind of like, you know, it's like, I don't need to hear this. You know, like they supported me, but it was like they, they didn't get it. They couldn't understand it. It's like, well, how are you a dad and a neurosurgeon? I mean, there really shouldn't be any differentiation, you know, between that. Um, so it, it, it's that kind of thing that they don't mean to be harmful or they don't mean to separate you from other people, but in their mind they do. And those kind of hurdles I think are more difficult to overcome. You couple that with the fact that healthcare right now is in a very challenging state. Um, the pandemic has really put many roadblocks and I think most people on this call today or uh, this, this um, this event today, you know, have lived through that and, and the challenges of getting your medical education and that sort of thing. And so there's, there's going to, there's a lot of halo effect of the pandemic that, that you all are going to experience for the next few years that will make it a little bit more challenging as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, on that note of many challenges in healthcare, you spoke to this um, in a few different ways, but is there kind of one particular way that you would say is the the top that you have maintained resilience in the face of adversity during your career? Um, I'm going to be honest, my resilience mostly comes because of the wonderful support that I've had. Um, my friends, but also my spouse. Um, not everybody can rely on that. But if you are going to have a spouse or a partner, then I really encourage you to have one that's going to be you know, really, really supportive of you in that. Um, if they don't support your career, it's really, really, really tough. Um, now, that doesn't mean, as, as I said, that my, my spouse just said, you know, do whatever you want, travel as much as you want, you don't have to come home and have dinner with the family or anything. Um, but, but always I could bounce things off of him and talk out things that had happened um, you know, if a patient died or I had that outcome, I had a way of being able to express that and then wake up the next morning and start again. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of in the, in the same vein, you talked a lot about how, um, women are still doing the majority of, of work in the household, despite when both, you know, in a male female relationship, when both are working, <laughs> uh, how have you been able to kind of combat that and, um, to the extent possible, kind of ensure equity in all of that as you are, have been developing your own career. 
Right. So again, I mean, I, I happened to, you know, partner with somebody who, you know, it wasn't a matter of him helping me out with the household activities. It was just a shared responsibility. And um, that's the attitude that hopefully you can have with your partner that whatever, you know, is to be done is shared. Now, you know, we set up some rules. I told him from the beginning that I hated taking the trash out. So he agreed he would always do that. And there were other things that he preferred not to do that I always did. But, and, you know, the, all joking aside, um, even though we, there were things that each of us were better at than the other one, it, there was never this sense that it was my responsibility or it was his responsibility. What got done was always who was best positioned to do it at any given time. Uh, and the fact that we could also trade off was really useful. So if I had had a really bad day at work, sometimes all I wanted to do is sit and, you know, watch a half an hour of television with my kids. And, and other times I just wanted to disappear into the kitchen and cook and not have anything to do with my kids because I needed that sort of alone time. So, um, you know, we, we found a good way of balancing that an awful lot of the time. Um, I, I mentioned having dinner with your family. I mean, I, I set an immutable time to leave work every day and that was so that I could eat with my family every night. It took me a little while to get it right. I was coming home five or ten minutes late on a regular basis and my my kids and my husband let me know that that was unacceptable. But, you know, those dinners were really the, a really important thing because that was where I was not a neurosurgeon. You know, we didn't watch television. We didn't answer our phones. It was just family time. And um, our, our kids who are now grown adults, they're in their 30s, you know, remember that time as being when the family came together. And for me, it was like it it, it restored a, a great deal of my, my energy and my sort of peace uh, within me. So I, I hope I would really encourage, uh, I know, Nikki has lots of questions for me, but I would really encourage anybody in the audience to, um, to throw up some questions and I'm, I'm happy to uh, uh, answer any questions. I think any question or just about any question. <laughs> uh, we did have a comment in the chat from someone saying, thank you for the encouragement to be daring. Um, as someone who immigrated from Crimea during my teens and lived on my own, forcing me to carve out my own path, I faced similar challenges. So it's nice not to feel alone in this journey. So, uh, and it looks like we do have a question. Um, I can show this on the screen as well. Um, sorry, give me one second to read out that question. So um, with my Goggin, um, we, I, I, the, the, the great story is not only uh, did we connect, but we were the ones who started WINS. And um, it, it started, we were at a resident luncheon for the honored guest at, at a meeting. And I sat down and typically you would walk into a room and the entire room would be men, which is what happened. And so I would usually pick a table sort of towards the back um, because I was at a small program. And so I didn't know anybody else in the room and I hadn't really connected with any other residents. Well, I sat down at a table and Corinne then came and sat down at the table with me because she had the same things like, oh my gosh, there's a woman here. And we had to be neurosurgeons. It wasn't like some of the events where there were also nurses or spouses, because this was a resident only event. And and after she sat down next to me, then Edie sat down because she saw two women sitting together. So she came up as well. So here we were sitting at a table of eight people with three women, which was like unheard of. And when the talk was over, it was like we were these magnets, like every woman in the room came to our table. And that was when we actually agreed to meet for a drink that night. And we said, you know, any woman that you see that's in neurosurgery, come and have a drink. And um, we had a drink in the hotel bar and that was when we decided to start WINS. So that was in 1989 and WINS had its first meeting in 1990. Um, my daughter had just been born and my son was already incubating. Um, so he was a few months away. So. The first picture of wins, both my kids are there, uh, one born and one not. But anyhow, um, so, you know, Corinne and Edie and then Gail was one of the people who came up and we just said we're going to have dinner at the national meetings whenever we're all there. 
and we just made it a priority after the opening reception. We took ourselves off to a quiet place. You have to remember this is the 1990s. You know, this was before internet. This was before, you know, you could, you know, chat and Zoom and do all those sorts of things. And so we only physically saw each other twice a year, but we made it an absolute top priority that we were going to have dinner together. Um, and since we all rose to leadership pretty quickly, we were going to pretty much all the meetings. So we met once or twice a year. We had our dinner. And in between that, we would send messages. And um, if any of us had a grant proposal, if any of us were building a program, we always shot it to the other people and they would they would give us feedback on it. Um, you, I also have a, a group of people from college who have gone into very different professions and I have stayed connected with them. And, you know, I have mentored a number of people who found their network um, with their college friends, with other women who have become professionals in things other than medicine. So it doesn't necessarily have to be other women in neurosurgery. But it does have to be, it, it, it's very helpful to have it be women professionals who are experiencing similar sorts of things and with whom you can really be honest. I feel like a dreadful mother this month, you know, <laughs> or, you know, I, I, you know, whatever, whatever the nitty gritty is of, of how you're feeling. So let's see. Uh, we've got another question. How would you recommend people seek out mentors in neurosurgery? Um, these days, it should be a lot easier. WINS actually runs a mentoring program, so I'll give a shout out to WINS. And um, I believe, uh, that, you know, Roxanne Todor, who is one of my residents, and I think uh, Susan Panulo have been really um, proactive in, in designing and implementing these programs. Um, the AANS also um, offers a program once you become a resident that you can be assigned a mentor outside of your own program. And, and and these days, I would encourage people to really, you know, have perhaps more than one mentor. It's good to have a mentor within your program once you get into a neurosurgery training program, because that person is going to be able to mentor you based on your clinical skills, on your surgical skills, and on how you're doing within the residency. Um, and you may be assigned one, and if they're not a good fit for you, then try to find somebody within your program who is a good fit. Um, but having a mentor outside of your program can give you a different perspective on things. There may be things that are happening inside your program that you'd like to speak to somebody else about, you know, without really talking about it inside of your program. Somebody who has a different perspective, a, a, a wider perspective. Um, so for that, I would encourage you to, you know, use the WINS program or use the AANS program um, to get yourself a mentor. Now, before you get into a training program, WINS does offer a medical student mentorship opportunity, and that's probably one of the best ways to find them as well. Absolutely, thank you. And kind of along those same lines, um, one of the, uh, another question that came up during your talk was, what sort of qualities or actions can men in the field, whether they are, you know, medical students, neurosurgical trainees, or attending neurosurgeons, um, do to be true allies to women in this field? Well, I, I think I'll, I'll come back to this whole notion of systems thing. So I think that that men can support you on an individual basis, and I think that that you you hope that they will do that. And by support, I mean, you know, treating you fairly and equally and all the rest of it. But you know, men are oftentimes in a better position because they are the established group um, mm -hmm. being able to affect the systems changes. So, you know, they are the ones who really need to make sure that they, you know, shout out against things in the system that keep people down or that don't allow free and fair access. Um, and, you know, I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of what leadership says and does about things like sexual harassment, bullying and harassment. Um, when, when I give my talks, I say that if, if bullying, harassment or microaggressions or any of these things happen and, and somebody in leadership doesn't call it out then then 
the hurt is multiplied. So the person who that's happened to feels even they feel they feel abused, but they also feel isolated because it's happened to them and no one has spoken up on their behalf. The person who did it gets away with it or is not made aware of the fact that they have offended somebody because no one has spoken out. And then the people who are around to witness it, okay, don't hear the message that that kind of behavior is unacceptable. So there's a three part harm that comes when people in leadership and, and influence don't call out that kind of behavior. So that's a great example of where the system creates the environment um, that that changes the behaviors um, by consistently sending the message that it's important of leadership. When, when I speak of the, the inspired and innovative leadership in, that I've worked under, it's, it's because the two of them consistently send out messages about things like harassment, microaggressions, you know, bias and that sort of thing, but also about the importance of, of recognizing leadership skills um, of underrepresented minorities and women and their dedication to that. I mean, they haven't, you know, uh, they've appointed an engagement officer just to say, we want our people to not burn out and to be engaged and that that's an important part of it. That's a really powerful message. Um, that's not just the message of work harder, do more, you know, all we care about is what you're doing for us and how you're building us up. They're sending out the message that they care about us as people as well as uh, what we can contribute to the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and so that's a really powerful systems message that they send out. Absolutely, those are all so important. Um, we have maybe a couple minutes left if anyone else has any other questions they wanna throw in the chat for Dr. Benzel. Um, in the meantime, do you think um, that kind of the, the trailblazing that you have done as a woman neurosurgeon um, and so many others like you um, helps to kind of help clear the path for some of the uh, underrepresented minorities and increasing diversity in neurosurgery in other ways, not necessarily just gender diversity. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I mean, we recently were, I was recently trying to recruit somebody who was another underrepresented minority and they they specifically asked, you know, what the environment might be like for them because they came from a place where they had not felt very comfortable. Um, and, and, you know, and I said, well, fortunately, because I'm, you know, the vice chair and kind of I set the tone for things, I can assure you that I, you know, I do everything that I can to make sure that it's a welcoming environment for all people regardless of what your background is or whatnot. And, you know, that individual, you know, came and, and became one of, you know, our new employees, our new neurosurgeon staff, neurosurgeons. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that, that when, you know, people like me who have experienced it can get to places of leadership, first of all, you know, you recruit differently. You know, you, you don't just recruit from all the same old places that everybody else has always recruited from. You actually seek out these people, um, but they also sort of naturally come to you and then you can you can ensure that you provide a welcoming environment for them so that some of these people who may not have entered into academic medicine might end up in academic medicine because now they feel welcome and embraced. Um, so we have like couple minutes, two more questions popped up. What advice do you have for female medical students interested in neurosurgery who have already been told no? I, I guess it depends on why you've been told no. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, you never, I mean, I was told I couldn't take calculus. I was told I couldn't play basketball. I was told a lot of things that were no. Um, if, if, you're, if you're, your grades or your board scores are really, really poor, um, it's going to be really hard to enter into the world of neurosurgery because it's so competitive. If you've been told no just because you're a woman, then I would just completely disregard it, and I would find <laughs> um, I would find another mentor. And and if you have struggled in 
you know, your grades or your board scores, well, there won't be board scores anymore, but if you have struggled in your, your grades, then there all are, there are alternative pathways into neurosurgery, but they are difficult. Um, there are people who go into general surgery who then enter because the position becomes open, but um, they, it's definitely a tough climb if that's why you've been told no. Um, if, if that's the case, then I would encourage you to spend a year in a neurosurgery program either as some kind of fellowship position or some kind of research position and demonstrate to a small number of people how talented and accomplished you are and can be and hopefully get one of those people to be your your champion and your advocate and there are a number of places that offer that um and hopefully that answered your question what's your favorite thing about being a neurosurgeon um, I could say the fact that uh, I'll be able to retire soon and <laughs> they want me to retire. No. Um, my favorite thing about being a neurosurgeon, you know, it, it's probably not just about being a neurosurgeon, but perhaps because of the type of medicine that, that a neurosurgeon practices, people walk into my office and oftentimes within five or 10 minutes, um, Sorry, I'm just looking at the, um, the yeah. next question. But um, oftentimes, um, sometimes people walk into my office and within five minutes, they've told me about, um, you know, the, the death of their child or about, you know, how their wife passed away or about some work challenge they've had or some other very, very intensely personal aspect of their life. And, and, and I'm always stunned, I'm always honored, but, but people walk into my office and share their, their precious and important moments with me about their pain, about their suffering, about their lives. Um, and they trust me almost from the moment that they walk in the door. Um, and so it's, it's really, really, I, I feel like it's a gift every time one of my patients does that with me and connects with me in that way. Um, and, and that's very, very special. Um, we also have the capacity to really help a lot of patients and it's not always because we cure their brain tumors or cure their medical problems, but we can help them in many, many ways to deal with those things. Um, so uh, the next question, and I don't mind. Uh, uh, oh, I got I, I got rid of it already, but so we can get the real story. And, and yeah, it's, it's, I've lived in that world for 35 years, and I have many, many men who have supported me and promoted me and advocated for me. Um, I've had some that haven't, um, but I I've, I've worked in that world, and most of my friends in neurosurgery are men. Um, you saw that picture of Ed Benzel and I, and that was a genuine picture. He and I have been close friends for over 20 years. We met because we had similar names or the same names. Mm -hmm. Our families are friends. Um, he stayed at my home his, I, when his wife had surgery and he had to go off to a meeting. I went and stayed with her and cooked her meals for her and, and helped her navigate having, you know, being on crutches and that sort of thing. Um, my husband stayed with them as well. So, uh, I, there's nothing about men that I don't like it as a <laughs> general rule. Um, and there are many who have done many great things for neurosurgery and medicine and for my own career. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, completely agree. And you handle that question very well. <laughs> Um, so thank well, you. So I know much. you have a very exciting day, uh, yeah. and I'm gonna head out on a hike because I'm actually on vacation, and so my husband and my two dogs and I are gonna go off and do a hike up in the mountains of the. Well, wonderful. Well, I hope you enjoy that. Thank you so much for giving us your time, especially while you're on vacation, and for answering all these wonderful questions. Thank you so much, and um, we're. So excited to continue on the rest of the day on Zoom. So for all everybody watching, make sure you hop on over to the Zoom and we'll continue with our next panel. So thank Have you again. Have a great day and I look forward to meeting all of you in the future as you uh, traverse your careers in neurosurgery. Thanks so much.